today I'm going to speak about a selflessness as a principle of brahmacharya life and some of the, some of the particular implications of that. I'm bringing this up. Uh, there's a particular situation facing me. The nature of Kali Yoga is that it's so insidious. Do you know what the word insidious means? Would you like to try and define it? Give a quick definition of it. Insidious. Means... I think the, I'm just saying because I think the others don't. Do you know what insidious means? Yes, you're an MA in English. Is it? You're an MA in English, I heard? BB. What does that mean? BA in English. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know what insidious means? Insidious. Okay. Insidious means something very evil, Yeah, evil, dastardly, uh, harmful, male malevolent means of uh, of uh, bad intent, and often subtle also. Subtly malevolent, and that means that you you may not immediately uh, detect its or its symptoms. So uh, kali you means kalahal. You don't know what that word means. Everywhere, I'm speaking here to one, two, three, four, five, six devotees from India. Do you know what kalahal means? Do you have that word in Tam Tamil? No, kalahal means uh, quarrel, descent. Kali means uh, Kalahal. So the nature of Kali Yoga is so insidious that even between guru and disciple, in which there's, that is supposed to be a relationship of deep trust. Actually, between a real guru and real disciple, that means spiritual guru and spiritual disciple, because there's, there are also, there are also uh, family gurus who, who perform more like a priest, or there may be gurus for teaching music or dance, but even in that, the relationship is very, supposed to be very close. But uh, that is supposed to be, that trust is supposed to be there even more than one would trust one's own parents, which in traditional cultures, the trust is very deep, not in the modern age. So anyway, the, in Kali Yuga, Kali is so uh, insidious that in between Guru and disciple, there can be misunderstandings. Kali Yoga, especially Kali, the personality of Kali, especially enters In the fifth place, he was given for dwelling by Maharaj Parikshit, where there is gambling, animal slaughter, uh, illicit sex and intoxication. These are all places of Kali. But Maharaj Kali said, well, this is, there's no place where in your kingdom where these exist. So then he was allowed to reside in gold. And nowadays, all the gold is locked up and we have imaginary money or theoretical money. At one point um, there was gold, gold coins, then it became paper money, and then plastic, and now it's mostly all theoretical. It just doesn't exist. You just write, yeah, the plastic. You just write, you sign 20 billion dollars from one account to another, but there's no, it's just theoretical. It doesn't I mean, there's no actual... Anyway, that's not the main point of what I wanted to discuss. I wanted to discuss the principle of selflessness. Oh, okay, well, as going off on tangents, I'll just go off on another little one. This morning, when you were singing the Tulasi Arati Kirtan, you, for the second day in a row, you sang Seva Adhikara. The word is Seva Adhikara. There's no word as Adhikara. Uh, which shows that it's a long-standing parampara. 
This is going on for many, many years. When I first joined, there were devotees improperly singing Seva Adi Kora, and still it's going on. So you can see, it's, uh, it's a small thing, but it's wrong. So it's better to do it right. So, uh, yeah, the basic principle of um, Brahmacharya life in, in, in ISKCON or in, in a spiritual organization is that we come uh, for spiritual life. We come for spiritual, not material gain. That's understood. That's supposed to be the situation. We come to serve. Uh, that means selflessness. Um, there are many aspects of selflessness. One of them is that one agrees to be controlled. One vol voluntarily agrees to act under authority. <coughs> Another is that one is supposed to have uh, minimal possessions. Uh, the minimal possessions are described actually in Srimad Bhagavatam. We don't exactly follow that. There's the uh, mekala, the belt made of munja grass, I think it is, and uh, a stick. Brahmacharya has a stick. Well, that's one less thing that Brahmacharis don't have nowadays. But anyway, the idea is minimal possessions. And nowadays, it seems the minimal possessions also include some kind of uh, audio playback device, cell phone, which is essential for everyone in the world. Right? If you don't have a cell phone, you cannot live in this world as a proper human being. I don't want to live in this world. That's why I never had a cell phone. <laughs> uh, yeah, all such necessities are there. Brahmachari traditionally has an umbrella. Have you seen the picture of Vamana Dev? He always, has, always shown with an umbrella. Brahmachari with an umbrella. <clears throat> anyway, the point is to have uh, minimal possessions. And brahmachari, brahmachari life is especially meant for practicing and training in nirmama nirahankara. Nirmama means I don't have a sense of, of non-possession. Mama means mine and nir is uh, negating. And nirahankara. Ahankara in the material world means to think I'm a very big person. I'm very important. So, near Mama, near Ahankara, this training is there because in the material world, the general sense is Ishvaro Hamaham Bhogi. Ever heard me quote that before? Almost every lecture. Because that's the, that is what we are trying to overcome, this mentality to understand that Krishna is the controller and the enjoyer. I am not. So, near Mama, near Ahankara, these words come up in Bhagavad Gita in sequence, Nirmamo Nirahankara, in the Krishna's description of the devotee in the twelfth chapter. So uh, one is supposed to practice this rigorously in Brahmacharya life. That again, practice. It may not be fully internalized, but that practice is there. And by perform it externally, one is supposed to uh, imbi imbibe that internally, that one's consciousness is purified by that. So that is done, we, we learn of traditional brahmachari life, how the brahmacharis, they would uh, live uh, very simply and serve their guru completely selflessly. Um, <clears throat> Most brahmacharis uh, in traditional Varnashram society, they marry, although it is not completely required. Uh, those who join as brahmacharis in Iskon, generally the idea is that, well, they're going to give it a good go at not getting married, although most of them do end up, unfortunately. Well... I shouldn't say that. I'll, accept, I'll upset the Grihastas if I say that. But uh, That's my sannyasi perspective. Um, marriage means within the Grihasta ashram, which is also meant for purification, 
there is uh, some small allowance, some allowance for indulgence to, to some degree for the Ishvaroha Mahambhogi principle. But it's, the more one takes that allowance, the more one goes away from Krishna. So Grihastha life is also meant to be an ashram, uh, a place for purification. But a Brahm Brahmachai life is meant to be uh, very rigorously uh, living on the principle of nirmama nirahankaraha. <clears throat> now, um, there's a problem when, when a Brahmachai tends towards Grihastha Ashram, not properly situated. Um, yeah, the problem is that it requires that marriage. I'm speaking here in generic terms. That means this is not just something regarding one person. This is a common syndrome, which we've seen again and again and again. Now, uh, as I said, the uh, Brahmacharya is supposed to have mi uh, minimal possessions and work and uh, serve under authority and in the beginning that may be very strict just like for young children that is very strict <coughs> but as they get older they, they naturally they're given more level of independence in the beginning the children need to be totally controlled they can't do anything for themselves but gradually as they learn and they they become able to do things for themselves and they they gain some measure of uh, independence and brahmacharis in our ISKCON ashrams also uh, at some point they're given some level of independence and responsibility uh, that's wanted at least well I, I heard one temple presidents once actually I've heard this more than once that say that wouldn't it be good if all the if all the brahmacharis would just do what just I actually heard the word like robots, but I, I don't agree with that because human beings are not robots. Living beings are not robots. And Krishna has us with limited independence. Robots can't love Krishna. So our limited independence that has to be uh, developed and exercised so that we uh, naturally tend toward Krishna. Uh, or our natural tendency to Krishna is awakened. Now, um, so some level of independence is given, that means some responsibility. Some responsibility is meant to go with that. And uh, devotees, they may be given some uh, responsibility within the mission also, apart from personal responsibility. Personal responsibility to uh, get up in the morning, for instance. It's not that it should always be forever that a devotee has to be woken up and shaken and uh, one is supposed to come become personally responsible for washing your own clothes and things like that. So, uh, apart from individual individual responsibility, one may be given responsibility over others to become somewhat of a leader or to take up some particular service in, one, in which one not is, is not particularly supervised, is given the independence to do that. Now, as soon as one is given responsibility, uh, there comes the question of possessions and control. Or not, it may be not exactly possessions, but... Uh, uh, well, a, a leader may be heard to say, oh, these are my men. Or he's supposed to take, yeah, if you take responsibility, for instance, for the <coughs> microphone, to use an example, then uh, it's almost as if it's yours. It, it's almost like that. You're using it in service, but you take the responsibility. You look after it. And there may be more and more things given to you. And you may have control over p 
people to, to some extent. You, you become their authority. You're, you may be working under another authority, but you have authority over others. So, um, those who have, the ment- who have developed this, who have well developed this spirit of nirmama, nirahankara, when they get things to use in Krishna's service, they're entrusted with them, uh, they flourish. Uh, with, they get things to use and they get control or authority over others, but because they have the spirit of nirmama, nirahankara, Nothing is mine. Everything is meant for Krishna. Uh, I am a servant. Then they flourish. But others who have not developed that, uh, <coughs> then they flounder. Flourish and flounder. These. Flounder literally means like a fish which is taken out of water and it's flapping about. It's, it doesn't do well. Um, so usually someone new in devotional service, it's, it's best not to give them much responsibility because many times we see, especially new devotees, they may be materially very capable, but if they're spiritually not developed, then um, we see in many cases that by the, uh, the Ishvaro Hamahambhogi tendency, they don't, uh, because that has not been <coughs> diminished and the, the nirmama nirahankara principle has not become prominent, then they uh, start to think of what is given to them for use in Krishna's service as their own and they tend to think of uh, devotees who are under their authority as instead of seeing them as prabhus who are to serve by directing them, they start to see them as uh, sub- actually subordinates in every sense of the term. So we've actually seen that many times, that people who are the devotees who are given uh, responsibility prematurely, they often... Uh, their, their, their service in some ways may go up, but their spiritual advancement goes down. And that, that tendency towards Ishvaro Hamahambhogi consciousness, that naturally leads one toward uh, Grihastha consciousness, or even non-Krishna consciousness, rather than the uh, Brahmachari consciousness. Now, uh, <clears throat> in that consciousness, though one is working with or serving, one tends, because of the, the, the lack of nirmama, nirahankara, and the, the prominence of Ishvara Hamahambhogi consciousness, then you know what these terms mean? Okay, good. Then um, one starts to think that I am doing so much. These are my possessions. And it's quite common that brahmacharis who have come with a motive to serve and for spiritual advancement, uh, when they uh, become householders or they're tending toward family life, they start to think, I worked hard for so many years, now I have nothing. Uh, they may think, well, if I'd have been working in kami life, I could have had so much money. And they might have had, but they wouldn't have had the opportunity to serve Krishna. That's what brahmachari life is meant for, for serving Krishna. The brahmachari principle is that um, <clears throat> we're here to serve, not to take out anything uh, materially. If we think that I deserve this, I raise so many funds, we've heard this before sometimes. 
devotee says, I, I raise so much funds. I deserve, I should be given this much. I should be given so much money. There's even <coughs> one of my uh, ex-disciples, I guess you could call him, who from the beginning actually he was very independent and he's been demanding and threatening money from me for the last few years because he thinks that I cheated him by preaching Krishna consciousness and, uh, and uh, he deserves so much money because I spoiled his life. It's actually become quite demoniac. Although, you know, he just turned, I didn't force him to join. There's no such thing as forcing anyone to join. And actually gave him, because he was so independently minded, I gave him a lot of freedom. I actually told him so many times, live in the te- spend time in the temple. But he liked to be very independent. And then later he complained. So, um, <clears throat> the uh, brahmachari principle is that uh, if one is, I mean, that should be understood that uh, if you decide to leave and get married, then it's not that you can take out, I, I worked so hard and therefore this is mine, that is mine. I, no, it's all for, for Krishna. Now you may say, well, then better don't join. And there's quite a lot of preaching like that. Uh, so some kind, something, not exactly. When we say preaching, we mean that which helps one to come to Krishna. But there's quite a lot of preaching like that all over the world. If someone is thinking of joining full-time, it must be in America, yeah, definitely it's in America also. People say, no, no, you have to think of your, your future. What will happen if you decide later that you want to uh, be married or do something else, non you don't want to be full-time dedicated. You have to look after yourself first because no one will look after you. And it's true that uh, <coughs> devotees should know this, that ISKCON as an organization does not commit itself to uh, look after devotees for their whole life if they do a few years of service or give them what is called a golden handshake. Do you have that saying in America? You know what that means. But they don't know what it means. I'll explain. Golden handshake means someone's been working in a company for some years and then they leave. And when they leave, they, the company gives them a, a, some sum of money <coughs> as a kind of appreciation or something like that. <coughs> So we don't undertake to do that. Uh, Srila Prabhupada did want for, for Grihastas the arrangement of rural communities where they can live simply and uh, that's also good for nirmama nirahankaraha rather than this rajasic society which promotes the consciousness of Ishvaro, Hama, Hambhogi and one is considered uh, advanced in civilization, the more one has possessions and the more one is expert in sense gratification. Whereas Brahminical culture means the more one is advanced in Nirmama Nirahankaraha, he's more advanced. So Srila Prabhupada wanted that. Uh, to date we haven't done very well as a society in establishing that, but at least we can say within our small circle here, we are making some steps toward that in Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu. So, <coughs> devotees should know that. Maybe we should tell devotees when they join, although um, it's basically an understood principle not only in ISKCON, but to join any religious order, just like if you become a Cistercian monk, for instance, or a Greek Orthodox monk, uh, you being from, your body being from a Greek background. The Greek Orthodox Church still have some really far-out monks, some really hardcore monks who live very austere and meditative lives and prayerful lives. They're quite 
amazing people actually. So, uh, if someone decides after 20 years as a Greek Orthodox monk, I don't think it happens much that they want to become a punk rocker or something instead. Uh, it's not that they're given a, an electric guitar or something by the Greek Orthodox Church to go and do it. They, 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 they can leave... I don't, but it's understood when you join that... that uh, it's understood that you're, you're coming here for spiritual life and uh, for dedicated life. Um, now, the uh, objection may be the, it is the quite common one, that, well, the sannyasis live opulently. Sannyasis in Iskon live op opulently. Maybe... Some of them do. Srila Prabhupada often lived opulently. He had opulent quarters in many places. He also lived for a month in Bhubaneswar in a mud hut in January 1977 when he had very opulent quarters in many places all over the world. So Srila Prabhupada did. Uh, he used that for preaching, just like we. Uh, I personally saw in London he had very beautiful quarters and uh, very opulent quarters and big people would come to big, prominent people in society would come to Srila Prabhupada they, if, if Srila Prabhupada if they'd invited him to some tenement no one would have come but uh, inviting him to a big opulent country house uh, then people you know, big people of society will come who Srila Prabhupada wanted to and did preach to in London, in Melbourne and in so many places, everywhere New York, big people came to see Srila Prabhupada because in worldly terms they thought he was a big man because he had buildings and a society and opulent quarters and uh, so they judge by uh, one's by, by external symptoms Although Srila Prabhupada, of course, was fully in the mood of Nirmama Nirahankaraha, that's sometimes questioned about our sannyasis, but uh, whether they are living, whether they actually have that mood, or whether they're enjoying. But one important thing is that they don't have wives. So anyone who can live without a wife and, mm -hmm. and preach Krishna consciousness, people, and be a sannyasi, which means that you don't have any private life. You, you know, sannyasi he can't just decide to go out to you know to a movie or you know to a disco or something like that. He he he's uh, constantly under surveillance, you could say. The, the camera is always on him. Sannyasi era alpa chidra sarva loke gai. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that even a small fault of a sannyasi is widely broadcasted. Every, not widely broadcasted, everyone shouts it out. So, um, people tend to give donations to sannyasis. If they did decide to have a wife and all this kind of thing, then people wouldn't give it to them, but they'd give it to them because they have that renunciation, which isn't so easy to maintain that and to be uh, an example for others. Now, uh, some people may say, well, they're not setting a good example. Well, if they're not, then Krishna will look after them. <laughs> Krishna, it's, it's, everyone gets what they deserve. You may say also that many leaders in our society, they live very well. Uh, and even the brahmacharis, in many cases, they may be living comfortably and opulently and maybe pilfering. Or pilfering means doing small, small time stealing. Or even more than they may be even. And, uh, well, I've even. I've even brought, in some cases, the, the, the leaders, if you bring that, I brought that to the attention of certain leaders in our society, that I know that certain brahmacharis are doing things which are not according to the brahmachari principles. And the response, I mean, in, in, 
acquiring a private house which someone donated to them. Don and for instance, and uh, there was a case of someone went to Brahmachari, went to order some clothes for the deities, and he took a cut for himself, and he was found out. And uh, I, I brought this to attention of the leaders, but the general outlook is well. What does it matter? We don't care. As long as they're bringing in some money, we don't care if they take something. I don't agree with that. It doesn't alter the brahmachari principle that if someone is desirous of advancement in spiritual life, then uh, they can't say, this is mine. It's all mine. If one's living in the temple, then he has to give everything. That is that is the standard. Srila Prabhupada, uh, for, for householders who are living in the temple community, Prabhupada said they could be there, but only if they live a very renounced life as householders also, which, again, we don't see that always, but uh, the principle still remains. So, uh, even if one says, well, I want to take this money to, for some service or for some preaching, I want to leave the, the, the Brahmacharya Ashram, still it's, uh, it's against the principle. You have to, you have to uh, raise funds. If you want to do some independent preaching or whatever, you have to raise funds independently. That uh, otherwise, uh, what happens is, it's just like um, one of my Brahmachai disciples, um, he fell in love with some girl from the congregation in the particular city he was living in and wanted to marry him, wanted to marry her. And although we tried to stop that, uh, he went ahead with it. And I didn't want him to live in the, or be in the temple community because I said that, well, if he, if he gets away with it, so to speak, then although we know he's a good devotee in many ways, but, but this is a, you know, it's a serious blemish of the, or, or it's, it's a serious deviation from the Brahmachai principle. Uh, and if he does it, then others may also think, well, I like that girl over there. Why don't I, you know, talk to her a little bit and then maybe I'll marry her. And, and uh, so I put this to the Tamil president, but he wanted to engage that devotee anyway, which is now going on. In many ways, the devotee is serving well. But recently we heard that another so-called brahmachari who's making friends with local girls uh, he had commented that, well, it's okay, I'll go ahead and do it anyway, and just like that other one, you know, after for some time they'll be a little angry, but then it'll be okay. So that's what happens. If you allow someone to set a, what is a bad example, then others will take that as a license to do the wrong thing. So uh, it's better to main maintain principles. Now you may think, well, this isn't very realistic. We're living, realistically speaking, we're living in an, in an ISKCON society where there are, we can't exactly, due to the very nature of the problem, we can't exactly uh, say how much, but probably there have been uh, many crores of rupees in India, many millions of dollars uh, in, outside of India of ISKCON's money, which is meant to be Krishna's money, which has been uh, mismanaged, spoiled, misappropriated, which is a polite word for stolen. <laughs> so so uh, what does it matter, you know, it, it just, you know, in this... the 
the small world of Bhakti Vikas Swami, and what does it matter if a few few rupees here and there? But again, uh, it's, well, the, the amount we're talking about is, or thinking about is small, although for, for the people you see building the buildings, who, who the Dalits who become the Mazdurs, you know, for them it's not a small amount. People who are they're living well below the poverty line. For them it's not a small amount. But anyway, it's all Krishna's money. I personally try to live by the principle that everything for Krishna, nothing for me. Uh, what is that? Idam narayanaya namama in the yagya. They say this is all meant for narayana. Not for me, uh, this uh, nirmama nirahankara principle. We should remember. Smaran nityam nityatvam. Remember, everything here is temporary. We come into this world with nothing. Uh, we leave with nothing. Material, no possessions. Um, factually, I possess nothing. But if the things which come into my care, I, they, they can be used either to go to Krishna by using them in Krishna's service or to go to hell by thinking that this is mine. Actually, Prabhupada said that if we, if we spend even a farthing, a farthing means like a paisa, it's in, uh, for our own, if we collect money in the name of Krishna, but we spend even a farthing for our own sense gratification, then we go to hell. It's a heavy... Heavy statement. That's right there in perfect quote. Que perfect questions, perfect answers, which you're distributing every day. Uh, so, near mama, nothing is mine. And near ahankara, just smara, yeah, just remember, who, we're very, very, very tiny little beings. Uh, we, we have a short life, and we're just tiny little beings on a tiny little planet, and who are we? We're so insignificant. So we should try to cultivate that consciousness. I try to cultivate that. Everyone should try to cultivate that. that that's spiritual life. That's especially in brahmacharya life. We're, we're here to learn these things. So uh, this is the principle of selflessness. There's also a principle of pragmatism. Well, that's not... No, actually pragmatism isn't really a principle, but pragmatism is the... Uh, the practical side, you can say. That sometimes if we're, you know, we insist on principles uh, which are not, uh, we don't have the power because we're not Ishvara, we're not Krishna. We don't have the power to implement them. Uh, then we can uh, unnecessarily get into or, or undesirably get into a big mess. Just like, just, just like to give an, an example, which is not really uh, contextual to this particular discussion. Um, there was a young girl in America many years ago. She must be middle-aged by now. She, was, she joined ISKCON. She was underage. I mean, she was not of the age of legal consent to, do a, to act independently, which is probably different in different states, isn't it? Is it? I think she is about 14 years old, which is probably underage in every state. So she joined ISKCON. She joined a temple. And she told the devotees that, uh, that you know, I, I, I'm unhappy at home. I want to be a devotee. And they, the temple sheltered her. And uh, the parents were trying to find her. And the devotees were lying to the parents and moving her from temple to temple, and uh, which was illegal. But the devotees thought, well, you know, she wants to be a devotee. We, we want to save this fallen, we want to save this soul from her parents and from the Kami society. It was an illegal activity, um, although it was well-intentioned. I, I guess that could have been the... Uh, that could have been quoted in that recent lecture I gave on the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, as a result of that uh, illegal activity, some years later, Iskon uh, had to face a massive legal case in which they lost 
millions of dollars. I'm not, they had to pay millions of dollars. Uh, and actually when Prabhupada found out about it, Srila Prabhupada having much more practical vision, although he came to the world to save all persons who want to come to Krishna consciousness, he told her, just send her home. Don't, don't do this. Similarly, in the case of our godbrother Nrishim Hananda, he was of legal age, but his mother was uh, his mother was harassing the devotees like anything, and she wanted him to go home. And in the end, Prabhupada uh, said to him, "Okay, you go home for some time, and then you come back." So in the meantime, she cooled down a bit, and uh, he came back, and he's going on with his devotional service even now, maybe, you know, more than 30 years later. So there's the principle and there's pragmatism. Another example is that uh, the BBT I, it got into a big court case with... Uh, what, what happened was they, they didn't want... Someone... One devotee who was actually, he'd actually not been connected with ISKCON. I think he was, maybe he was even expelled from ISKCON. But he wasn't connected with the legal body, whatever that is. is I mean, it's very, I, I don't even know if the <coughs> ISKCON devotees themselves know exactly what the worldwide, the legal status of ISKCON is. I mean, if some. I, I mean, I don't understand this exactly. And BBT, exactly what its status is, because it was worldwide, because it was registered in both California and in Bombay. Anyway, um, one devotee wanted to print the Macmillan, the old edition of Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> and the Bombay, or not the Bombay, the whatever, the BBT, they wanted to stop this, because they thought, we don't, we don't want this to be printed. It has things in it like with the title, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, it has some ridiculous things in it, which Prabhupada definitely didn't write and which definitely aren't true. The most egregious, to use this currently fashionable, <coughs> fashionable word, of which is that uh, there is a planet of the trees, when well, it's supposed to be Pitris, the forefathers. Anyway, it happened that... Um, the legal case was going against the official BBT and eventually um, they settled it out of court and uh, it went against the favor of, it went against the, what the official BBT wanted to do and that printing of the, what was called the Macmillan, is not the Macmillan edition anymore, they don't have the rights over it anymore, but the, that, I think 1972 edition is going on uh, anyway and uh, the BBT had to pay who knows how much some lots of money in legal fees and this and that so although the, I agree with the principle that the old edition should be superseded by the new edition the uh, pragmatically the, the course taken to try to enforce that in in hindsight, it's easy to. It's always easy to say. In hindsight, uh, wasn't such a good idea. Pragmatically speaking, also, um, we don't want to crush people who have come to Krishna consciousness with a desire to serve, um, but who later along the way find various difficulties in doing so, misunderstandings in doing so. Uh, that spirit to serve Krishna is very precious and that should, that should be fostered and not crushed. So we, we might, for the sake of that, we might even... Uh, Going uh, or not fully strictly try to uphold this principle. That could be a consideration also.
So, I mean, Srila Prabhupada with devotees who, uh, I mean, they, they out clearly, I mean, more or less just stole money from the ISKCON institution. There are cases where, where uh, or they stole money or misappropriate. Misappropriate doesn't always mean to steal, actually. Sometimes it's used as a euphemism for stealing, but it's, it can mean something somewhat different also. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada, um, especially for devotees, have done good service. Even if they did something wrong or they went against the principles, he would, he would often overlook that and try to encourage the, that precious spark of wanting to serve Krishna. So there are some thoughts. I left it inconclusive. Why? Well, life is like that. Like I say, we have there are principles which we should understand. We should all try to live according to the principles. We should try to make everyone understand the principles. Uh, at the same time, we have to understand that. Uh, this world is a very difficult place. Um, and for the sake of serving Krishna in the best way, there may be some, not, not adjustment to the principle, but to the application. Of, I mean, there may be some adjustment to the application of the principle also. And maybe not even everyone would agree with this principle. Like I say, someone... <coughs> I mean, it's clear in my mind, but uh, someone may say, yeah, why, what's, what's wrong if someone takes this or that? So, but I, that is not a very principled kind of existence. And if... Uh, and our, our preaching work can't really go forward unless the core devotees, especially those who are the leaders and the temple residents, uh, they are selfless. Otherwise, if, they, if people see that the, those who are supposed to be representing the Krishna conscious movement, they're making a, a business out of religion, then uh, they won't be. They, they themselves cannot become selfless, and then the whole thing becomes just another materialistic religion. There are already so many of them, <laughs> so we don't. We really need devotees to be selfless. And if those some devotees are not able to practice that fully, then as uh, we should try to help them adjust to that circumstance also, as much as is possible. Okay, any uh, questions or comments about this? Yes? Sometimes we know this is the principle. Now what to do, what is practical? Well, that's the difficult question. That's why I, that's why I didn't, that's why I left it at the end, I said, I didn't bring this to a conclusion because this world is very difficult and knowing exactly how to act, what's the best thing to do, is always, it's not always very easy. and it, it may be different in different cases because all circumstances are different. Uh, it's easy to say so-and-so made a mistake. Because people do make mistakes in, in various ways. In, and in Kali Yuga, especially. I mean, we see even in other Yugas that uh, there were misunderstandings and uh, bad dealings between others. Um, so, exactly what's the best thing to do? You can't say, you can't. It's, it's not fully predictable how people will react to what you do or, or how things will work out. Maya, her job is to make this world difficult. 
And it's not that when we join a spiritual organization that automatically everything becomes just uh, easy. Rather, we, in, in Krishna consciousness, we have to face so many difficulties as tests from Maya. Therefore, we should be Krishna conscious and be Padma Patramivam Bhasa, like a lotus leaf which is born in mud and sits on it, but it's not, it's, it's beautiful, not of the nature of mud, or, or the, that's the flower. Well, the leaf is on the water, but water doesn't stick to it. If you drop it, put a drop of water on the lotus leaf, it will kamala dala jala jibana talamala, it falls down. So how to apply it? Well, that's called wisdom. Wisdom means uh, how to live according to principles in a, in a world the very nature of which goes uh, against all wisdom. It's this kind of circular definition. In a, how to live sanely in an insane world by seeing the, seeing the underlying principle that we are meant for service to Krishna. That's supposed to come with age and experience. If one uh, lives in this world cultivating spiritual knowledge, then gradually uh, and one is supposed to become wise as he learns the practical application of that. If one, generally it's thought that old people are wise, but if one spends one's whole life watching TV, then you grow up to be an old fool. You know? Whereas there can be a young wise man also, if he's imbibed the message of Shastra. That may be a, a, also from previous lives, as one is picking up from previous lives. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, anything else? Any more thoughts on this, on these grave topics? Heavy topics? Yeah. How do we prevent this mentality entering ourselves and others? I'm just repeating for the sake of the recording. Yeah. I deserve something. I should get some kind of reimbursement. I should get some material reimbursement. Yeah. Well, um, let me answer that by giving the answer of Srila Prabhupada to another question. When George Harrison asked Srila Prabhupada, I can't remember exactly the question, but it was to the, that how can you prevent is gone from becoming like another mundane religion or the leaders becoming corrupt. Prabhupada said, if they follow all the principles and chant 16 rounds, how can you maintain purity, he said. When, after you've gone, Prabhupada said, if they follow the principles and chant 16 rounds. And George was surprised by the, what seemed the simplisticness as opposed to simplicity. Sim simplicity, obviously it was simple, but it seemed almost simplistic. Just by such a simple formula, you can keep pure, and, and Prabhupada said, yeah, that will keep them pure. And we see that again and again and again, Srila Prabhupada, in his letters, emphasized that devotees, they should rise early, chant 16 rounds, associate with devotees, follow the morning program, all these different things. He emphasized again and again and again. So, if someone is not doing that, they're, obviously they're having problems, and so that should be enforced. It may be in case some people actually do that, and still, they're difficult cases. But they're... Uh, Doing that, that should 
gradually purify their heart. Whereas if one doesn't do that, then already it's a sign that, first of all, he shouldn't be living in the ashram anyway. Um, second, that he's in uh, poor consciousness. So that should be insisted on for brahmacharis. And then there are other considerations, health consideration. But uh, it's probably better if a devotee has a long-standing health problem. Again, these are complex questions that they shouldn't uh, live in the ashram. They should be in a hospital or something. Or maybe go home. Because the ashram is meant for for people who can uh, give and contribute. The, the ashram is not supposed to be a hospital. Of course, if devotees are sick, we should look after them. But if they have long-standing health problems, then maybe they should, uh, you know, by which they're not able to follow sadhana for years together. Um, well, myself, for over a year, shortly after I took sannyas, I was... I couldn't do much, actually. I was, had headaches and I could hardly speak. But I, I made it through the morning program pretty much every day. But after that, I couldn't do much else. I was living in Baroda. In those days, there were hardly any, anyone coming. So they were kind enough to look after me. And I saw one devotee who was in uh, Belgrade. He'd had an accident and he could just lie on the bed all day. So he was still living in the ashram and people would come to him and he'd preach all day, actually. Even though he couldn't move anywhere or do anything. So we have to see. Again, we don't want to be uh, inhumanly harsh and say if someone's just sick, just throw them out. On the other hand, we, we can't turn the ashram into, especially if it's just a few devotees and just into some kind of medical hospital. In the case of devotees who have served for many, many years and they get old and sick, well, they, naturally they, they should be looked after. And they are, I've seen. I've seen, at least here in Iskon, India, I've seen devotees who get old. I, they're, they're looked after, even if they're not a sannyasi. <coughs> We saw in Bombay that uh, Jagarananda Pandit and uh, Kaveri and some others. Some... Actually, they joined when they joined, they're already quite old. But uh, as they got older, they were, they were looked after. They weren't thrown out due to incapacity. So again, um, we can't say exactly should we, uh, how should we help others? Yeah, well, we should try to spot the symptoms early. I guess. In some cases, it can be difficult to help others also. So people have to be ready to be helped. So, anything else? Shurasya dhara nishita duratya durgang patas tat kavayo vadanti. It's uh, <coughs> sharp like a razor's edge. This, this path is sharp like a razor's edge. Difficult to traverse, according to the learned. But by Krishna's grace, we can cross over. So I may think, well, it's so tough. Why advise anyone to join? Because, well, the beginning of that verse, which is uh, or saying that Shurasya uh, Dara, it begins with Utishta, Jagrata, Prapya, Varan, Nibodhata. Which means get up, wake up, attain the opportunity of human life. It's now is the chance. If we say, look to your material well-being, First, well, then you're going to remain in the material world forever. Some, sometime we have to take the, what may seem from the material perspective, a risk and jump, jump into Krishna consciousness and hold on for the mercy of Krishna. 
And as we also learn from Bhagavad Gita, Svalpamapya syad dharma syad trayate mahato bhayat. Even if whatever one does in Krishna consciousness is always for one's eternal benefit. Uh, in that regard, Srila Prabhupada also quotes Chaktabhasva dharmam charnam bhujam hara bhajanda pakvo tapatit tato yadi yatra kvava bhadram abhuda mushakim. Govarta apto bhajatang swadharmataha. I didn't quote that verse for a long time. Uh, the purport of which is that if one gives up everything for the sake of serving Krishna, if one gives up all one's material duties for the sake of serving Krishna, and in the course of doing so, before one is fully perfect in Krishna consciousness, he falls down, he's not the loser. Whereas on the other hand, if one executes one's uh, material duties very perfectly without being Krishna conscious, then there's no actual gain. So therefore, we, what from the material perspective might seem heartless, merciless, according to Daksha and others, uh, Preach to people to give your life to Krishna. Uh, actually, we are, we are followers of that renegade Narada Muni, not Daksha. We offer our, our full respects to Srila Narada Muni. Saying renegade, that was should be understood that said in, in a uh, it's praised by negation, by apparent insult. Well, from the material point of view, he is a renegade. All right, anything else?